I do know this much about music. There's four different kinds of uh, instruments. There's woodwind, there's brass, percussion, and strings. And I'm in the string department, okay? Now, th those when they're all in a symphony, or you watch a kid's band play, you ever seen that one on YouTube? That it was, it's, it's funny, but you don't want to laugh because they can't play, and it's terrible, but they're trying? <laughs> God bless them. <laughs> they don't all play the same note at the same time. You may have noticed me and Byron, we were playing together, but I wasn't always playing this exact same note that Byron did at the same time. But when you play together, it produces wonderful music. When you play together. How about a football team? Let me, let me roughen it up a little bit. That's the direction I took in life. <laughs> You've got different uh, positions. You've got a linebacker. You have a tackle. Quarterback, fullback, halfback, wide receiver, tight end, guard, all these different guys, and they're all doing different things. They're in different parts of the field. They're different things, but when they work together in their own respective roles, they help each other to achieve a common goal. Okay, they're all in it together. You may be doing a little different than me. You may be doing less than me. You might be doing more than me. You may be playing a different note than I am, but when we're all in the same team, we're all in it together, we all achieve the same goal together. And that's what we're gonna see here in Nehemiah 3, is gonna be called Nehemiah 3, we're all in it together. And I say that in the body of Christ, we're all in it together. Y'all are all in different places. Y'all come in here and different things on your mind. So Nehemiah went to rebuild uh, Jerusalem and in chapter two, he found people that had various backgrounds, but he had to find a way to get them to be all in it together. Verse 1, Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hananel. Next to Eliashib, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zachar, the son of Imri, or Imri, built. Okay, so Nehemiah, he began to delegate work to people. Let's get to work, guys, according to their vocation or their location. When I say vocation, according to their career path, it says the priest built the sheep gate. Now, why do you think priests were interested in building a sheep gate? That had to do with their vocation. That had to do with their job. They needed sheep and other animals to be brought in that gate, the sheep gate, for temple sacrifices. Okay? So probably sheep were raised on this side of town, and that's the best place to bring the sheep in. It's like if you're raising them up on the north end, don't bring them around to the south end to pull them in. Put a gate up there where they are. So that was the sheep gate. And the priests, they had a special interest on the sheep gate. That was their job. They did the sacrifice work. They brought them in to slaughter them for the temple. So that was their personal job to oversee. That was their job according to vocation. Now this priest named Eliashib. He's the grandson of Jeshua. Y'all remember Jeshua? Those have been following me. Uh, Jeshua was the high priest back in Zerubbabel's day. Now, if you recall, when the Jews came back to Jerusalem at first, they established Zerubbabel as the governor of Jerusalem. They didn't have kings anymore. They were under Persian rule now, so they didn't have kings this time. So Zerubbabel was the governor. And Jeshua is the grandson of Jehoiakim, who was one of the kings. Of Judah. So we don't have kings anymore, but we still got a kingly line here working. Now, Ezra verse three, uh, I'm sorry, Ezra chapter three, verse two, 
it speaks of Jeshua and Zerubbabel. They were working to restore the temple in Jerusalem after Nebuchadnezzar came and tore it down. So the point I'm trying to make here in this, what I'm trying to say, I think it's interesting you've got good family ancestry here. You've got a family line that's still at work in this whole thing. It's uh, godliness that was passed down to all these priests, and they actually wanted to be involved in the restoration of Jerusalem. Guys, when you have children and you raise your children in godly ways, let's say maybe you weren't. Let's say, well, I wasn't raised godly. At least you can be the one that starts it. Raise your children godly, and look what it propagates from you. See all this line of people? They're in it to win it, right? They're working because it was passed down, passed down, and you got these guys really working. So we have Jehoiakim, former king of Judah, passed down to Jeshua, passed down to Eliashib. This is a direct link from the king of Judah, rebuilding for a future king of Judah who has yet to come. <laughs> and we're still going to see that happen yet. This is God holding his messianic line in Jerusalem. You see that here. So uh, I'm certain that the Jews who were in Jerusalem during Nehemiah's time, probably a lot of those guys that were there were the ones who had been trained up in the Mosaic law under Ezra. Remember, Ezra came back previously before. In our recent teaching series, Ezra was upset. He heard that the Jews were intermarrying with foreigners. That was messed up because they were going to pick up their spouse's false gods uh, worship instead of worshiping the God of Israel. So if you remember, Ezra said, I've got to get down there and teach people the law of Moses. We've got to get back to God. So now that we see priests here in Nehemiah chapter 3, these are priests who were willing to set up the sheep gate. I think that gives us a good view of how much good Ezra, Ezra's ministry was when he came back before to restore the people back to the worship of God. I believe had it not been for Ezra, Coming before Nehemiah's time, I don't think there would be any priests at all that would care to build the Sheep Gate. This was Ezra's work that he had done a long time ago to restore the people back. Now there's priests saying, yes, let's build the Sheep Gate to bring the sheep in for sacrifice in the temple. That was Ezra's teaching still in the land right here. So not only do we have a passing down generation to generation, well, I don't have any kids. That's okay. Ezra taught people that weren't his kids, and they're in it to win it too. So either way, you can either teach your kids, or you can teach other people that you know. It's always going to carry down somewhere. I'm so thankful that we get to see progress here, that Ezra's kingdom work did something. It had a lasting effect on the Jews here all these years later. This is progress. Again, Ezra, remember, he, what are these people doing? They're turning from God. We see priests willing to work. You got to have take your hat off to Ezra for this because look at it still going. I think it's great. Show that wall map, and I'm not sure if you have it in. I think you probably have it in your bulletins too. If you can't see that, uh, so Nehemiah's account of these repairs. If you look where it says the sheep gate, that's up there on the northeast part of the wall, and they started to work around the city counterclockwise, counterclockwise because it says they went to the tower of the hundred and then the tower of Hananel. So they've just gotten started here. They've got a long way to go. So he's setting guys up. They're all going to work on this wall at the same time. Nehemiah 3, verse 3. Also, the sons of Hesaniah built the fish gate. What do you think comes through the fish gate? Hello. Built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz, made repairs. Next to them. Meshullam, the son of Bereshia, the son of Meshezebel. I've done pretty good up till now. My mouth just went, I'm done, I'm done. Next to them, Meshullam, the son of Bereshia, the son of Meshezebel, whoever, made repairs. Next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, made repairs. Next to them, the I'm not even going to try it, made repairs. The Tekoites, I guess. Lord help me. But their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. There we go. There's always somebody. I'm too good for this. I am a noble. Okay. So first off, okay, we already kind of had a hint to this, but why are these gates named like this? Why are they named? The fish gate, the sheep gate. You know, in the previous chapter, we read what's called the dung gate. 
Okay, think that one through. Okay. Each gate was named based on what their function was for. So obviously any waste that was accumulated in the city, that was taken out through the dung gate because it was closest gate to where they hauled off to the dump, I guess. The, the dump was out that way. I'm sure that the sheep were raised on a particular side of Jerusalem so that the sheep gate was the closest way to bring them in. Same for the fish gate. That was on the side of town where it was easiest for the people of Tyre. They could bring in their fish through that gate, the fish gate, to sell at the markets. Today, we have a road here called NASA Road 1. Why do you think it's called NASA Road 1? Well, because it runs by NASA. Okay, so we name it according to what it, it does. So roads are named based on what they do. And the gates are named by what they do also. Same principle. So typically, a, na a gate was named according to whatever came through it. Whatever went through it, the gate was named that. Okay, when I was in Israel, we went to the Wailing Wall, and we just walked through the Dung Gate. I know you got jokes you want to throw at me for that one right now. Okay, I said to everybody, y'all realize what we just walked through was the Dung Gate. <laughs> Is there another gate around? <laughs> so we came through the Dung Gate. So I have this on my mind, sheep to sheep, fish to fish. Okay, that's good. Dung Gate, here I am, Ray Jensen walking through. Anyway, moving on. So we see Merrimoth. The son of Urijah, son of Cause, made repairs. Now, he's a priest's son. Now, we have a lot of priests. We've got their sons. They're all working together. So this ought to pass more godly work down through the families. Dad is teaching me how to build. You got a priest, come on, son, we're going to do this. We're going to do this work together. And so more family inheritance is coming through this. The men of Tekoya, the Tekoites, it says. Those were guys that came from the hometown of Amos, if you remember Amos. That was about 12 miles south of Jerusalem. Amos was a prophet who lived 100 years prior to this time. So, again, you can see Amos probably had a lot of good on these guys. They remembered a lot of what Amos taught. They heard, hey, Jerusalem needs our help. Let's go. Good on Ezra. Good on Amos. Good on these priests teaching their sons. And you know what? Also, good on you if you teach the people to follow the Lord as well. Same thing. But as it says, the nobles of Tekoa didn't help work. They didn't put their shoulders to the work. What is a noble? A noble is somebody who is upper class. Cheerio. We'd rather have tea than come and do this. And I don't know why a Hebrew person would be speaking with a British accent if that was one at all. They have high class and social status. They got political power. Somebody that's way up the ladder kind of figures right. They're not helping. We're too uppity. We're too rich to help build these dirty walls and get calluses on our hands. We're too, just too high. So you got two classes of people mentioned here. Those with a godly drive, even if they're priests, we're going to build a wall. Hey, our job is to do sacrifice and temple stuff. It's not really our thing. Son, come here. I'm going to teach you how to build a wall. Nobles, no, we're too high. We're not doing that. Priests building the sheep gate. Every, every, you got guys putting in and guys not. And that's our, that's our society today. You got some people that are really driven and some people, I, I don't really care. I got too much of my own thing going on. People with a godly drive because they were raised with it and those who didn't care to build because, well, I guess either they weren't raised with it or pride got in their way. Probably a little of both. Nehemiah 3 and 6. Moreover, Jehoiada, the son of Pasea, and Meshullam, the son of Basodia, repaired the old gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Metaliah, the Gibeonite, Jadon, the Maronathite, the men of Gibeon and Mizpah repaired the residence of the governor of the region beyond the river. Next to him, Uziel, the son of Herahiah, one of the goldsmiths, look at that, a goldsmith made repairs. Also next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers. Guys, this intrigues me. You have a goldsmith and a perfumer building a wall, okay? They made repairs, and they fortified Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. And next to them, Raphaia, the son of Hur, leader of half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. Okay, you've got one leader guy way up the ladder. He's not too proud to build. Verse 10, next to them, Judea, the son of Harum, oh, I didn't even rehearse that one. Harumath made repairs in front of his house, in front of his house, guys. And next to him, Hattush, 
the son of Heshabniah, made repairs. Malchijah, the son of Haram, and Hashab, the son of Pehath Moab, repaired another section as well as the tower of the ovens. And next to him was Shalom, the son of Halahesh, leader of half of the district of Jerusalem. He and his daughters made repairs. Yeah, we got women in this too. Okay. Good to see that. Ladies are pitching in. But them crazy nobles, come on, jump in and push, man. That's what I want to say. I'm a noble. How dare you talk to me that way? I guess how they got away with it. Let's put that wall map back up again, or if you can look on your notes there. So we were told of all these people that worked on the walls between the Jeshaniah Gate, which is also known as the Old Gate. And you can see on the map here on the northwestern corner, And then the wall makes a turn south, right where the broad wall is at. And why do you think it's called the broad wall? Look at it. Well, obviously it's broad, (laughs) okay? Not too complicated here. It's broad. It's wider than a bunch of the other walls. Put up that other broad wall pic. I think it's a modern picture. Do you have that? They have unearthed part of the ancient broad wall. It's in what's called the Jewish Quarter in the old part of Jerusalem, you can see how wide it was. In the picture, if you look at there's a marker on the wall on the left, that shows how high they think the broad wall actually was. Now, the reason I show you these pictures, they're digging stuff up, showing that it's actually there. The reason I show you these things is I want to show you archaeological proof that the Bible is true. It is absolutely true. What it says is. Where it says was there, okay? There's a lot of people that think that Israel doesn't belong to the Jews. They think they have no claim to it, no right to it, that they didn't live there. They shouldn't be there. They need to be out. That's what they believe. But I want to show you the proof that it is their place. God gave this land to the Israelites. He gave it to the Jewish people. And this is proof being dug up all the time that validates that God's word is true. And I want you to see it. Okay? I've seen that wall there myself. We were driving along. We saw a gas station or a strip mall. They had a big corner of the parking lot cut out. They busted the concrete, and they were digging. You could see an old city down there. I mean, it's crazy if you ever get a chance to go to Israel and see that. So we read in verse 11 about the Tower of the Ovens. Where do you think the Tower of the Ovens got its name? What's going on with Tower of the Ovens? I want to show you a little something from Jeremiah 37, 21. It says, then Zedekiah, the king, commanded that they should commit Jeremiah to the court of the prison and that they should give him daily a piece of bread from the baker's street until all the bread in the city was gone. Okay, so they had a baker street. Welcome to Baker Street. What do you think goes on on Baker Street? NASA Road 1 runs by NASA. What's Baker Street? The bakery. Okay. <laughs> I'm led to believe the Tower of the Ovens is probably where the bakeries were at. That's the place you want to be. Uh, You ever seen the bread they put out in Israel? Anna saw pictures of me visiting Israel. They had a cart with beautiful bread. It's wonderful looking bread. It almost looks too good to eat it. She goes, I want to try some of that bread when we go there. So here we are, Baker Street. I'll bet the bakery side of town smelled a whole lot better than the Dungate side. I'm just saying. So I'd like to be on the bakery side. But from what's written, I would assume that bread bakeries had their chimneys built up along the wall. They used a tower. Well, the tower's not just going to stand, so let's use a wall. Let's build it like a chimney up the wall to hold it up so they could air out the smoke from their ovens. So we read they were laying beams and hanging up big doors. Now, what are these beams made of? These beams are made of timber. Now, I want you to remember Nehemiah had already asked for this timber. Back in Nehemiah 2, verse 8, he says, I need a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So Nehemiah already had this planned out. You don't just walk up and just, oh, I need beams. It's not like Home Depot or click on Amazon and they show up. He had to plan this out. He had to plan this out before he got there. So he had drafted up this huge project plan long before he ever came to Jerusalem, and it was God that told him how to line this all out. We see materials going up, people building, things are are kicking. 
Any of you in construction, you know you've got to go get your gear before you can build. I, I've heard Hank on the radio going to the other side of Houston to pick up stuff he needed to do his work. You got to have your logistics, logistics planned out or you're going to show up. Okay, let's build the wall. And people would say, with what? <laughs> we don't have anything. How do we do these gates? Friends, what I'm trying to say is that if you don't know how you're going to get through your next day or that next big thing, ask the Lord God. He'll put it on your heart. He'll say, okay, here's what you need. You need this and this and this, and you better write it down while he's telling you, okay, I have to do that. Write it down. He'll line out your life. Let the Lord God line out your life for what's ahead. You don't know what's coming. Nehemiah had not even seen these walls yet. He's already got materials. How did he know what to get? The Lord God told him what to get. That's, I think that's just amazing. All these materials were there to get the job done. So far now, we've seen Ezra's past ministry. It worked already that they had priests ready, all, all there, turned to the Lord by now, ready to build the sheep gate. Nehemiah's pre-planning had materials coming in. Things are running like clockwork because they said first, before they did anything, Lord, what do I have to have to do this? Friends, if you just dart out the door and say, well, I got this big thing I got to deal with, and you don't ask the Lord first, how do I contend with this? You're going to be in trouble. Probably going to make things worse. Ask God first. Consult with the Lord God first. He may give you a grocery list or a materials list or tell you what to do. It's always better to ask God first. He'll put it on your heart. Also in this fascinating story, uh, we have a perfumer working on, and that's the last guy I would expect to be working on a wall. What do you do? I'm a perfumer. And you've got a chisel and a hammer and you're hauling a wheelbarrow and all that. Oh, yeah, okay, that works. He's not too big. Hey, it's what I do. I mean, I, we look at people and we gauge people on what they do. Oh, you're one of those? Oh, I, well, look what I am. You know, we, he's a perfumer. He's working on the wall. We're all in it together, right? We've got a perfumer. We have a goldsmith. I'm sure he, his line of work is very different from this. You know, these guys, they could have said, you know, building walls ain't my thing. It's just not my thing. I, I'm different. I'm a truck driver. Going to church ain't my thing. I'm a construction guy. Going to church ain't my thing. I, you know, hey, it's everybody's thing. It should be. You know what? There, you know there's a day coming. We're going to be in eternity. It better be your thing or you're in big, hot trouble. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be your thing. You better make it your thing now. They could have said, it's not my thing. I work with perfumes. I'm going to set this one out and let y'all do it. It's not my thing. I've heard a lot of people say, it's not my thing. You're going to eat them words one day way or another. You're either going to swallow it willfully or you're going to have it shoved down your throat. Make it your thing. God ought to be your thing. Guys, this was all about Israel's defense from their enemies. All of us have enemies. You have people who are against you. All of us have it. You want defense? You need to build. You need to get behind that defense. And the best defense you're ever going to have in this earth, and I'm not kidding, because I've learned it, ask me my testimony, is first, you got to have Jesus Christ. And second, if you got Jesus, you need to do what he says. You need to get in the body of Christ. That is defense, big time. I'm not just trying to sell a church. You can go to any church you want to, but be in one. Be in the body of Christ. That is a defense. Survival is everybody's thing. You may be very different from me. I may be the perfumer to your goldsmith, and I don't know, but you need to survive, and that's what this is. So shame on them nobles. Yay for the daughters jumping in. I'm glad to see that, but you also got to take your hat off to the perfumers and the goldsmiths. They're taking up tools they've probably never used before. Well, my tools are very different than this. Take this big hammer. Oh, I'm going to feel it today. You know, that's going to be sore sleeping tonight. Well, I'll help you learn how to use it. Not my thing, okay, but will you help me? Friends in the body of Christ, you come in here and you say, well, this, I'm, I don't really know how to use y'all's tools here. We'll help you. It's okay. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to do the biggest stuff. We'll help you. It's all right, as long as you're pitching in. If the daughters can build the wall, friend, you can come in the body of Christ. Amen? Survival is everybody's thing, and they were all taking up tools they'd never been familiar with, but they were not doing it for themselves. Oh, that's not my deal. I don't know how. They're doing this for the glory of their God. If you want to glorify your God, pick up his tools, and let's build. I think this is great. So look at this big, it's a, it's a huge group effort here, 
And guys, this is how things get done in the assembly of God's people. Look at what great things people can do together if they'll only get together and work in harmony according to God's will. Leave your politics alone. I know you think different than me on some things. I get it. I know that. But we don't need that here. We just need to build a wall. I'm sure goldsmiths and perfumers had differences of opinions on lots of things. I'm sure the daughters had differences of opinions. I'm sure they were mad at the nobles. But you know what? Let's just get in and do the job. Body of Christ, we have all different walks out there. Let's just get in and do the job. Amen? Let's glorify the Lord God. It's not about you, and it sure ain't about me. It's about the Lord God, glorifying Him. Let's pick up our tools and work. But guys, this is fabulous. They're working for the Lord. Guys, that's the way I want to live. I want to live like this. That's why I love being in this church so much. I like being with different people, learning from them what they can do that I can learn from, like the, the, the kids learning from their priest fathers. Hey, we're going to build a wall. I've never built a wall before, Dad. Well, I'll show you. Come on in and let's do this in the body of Christ. As opposed to the prideful folks, they think they're high and mighty to pitch in, like those nobles. God's watching. Let's, let's glorify the Lord. Nehemiah 3 and 13. Hanan and the inhabitants of Zenoa repaired the valley gate. They built it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the refuse gate. Malchijah, the son of Rechab, leader of the district of Beth Hakarim, repair, repaired the refuse gate. He built it and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Okay, the refuse gate. Refuse. That's just the proper English King James version of saying dung. We're not going to call it dung. That's too dirty. Let's call it refuse. Okay? Refuse. Nice way to put it. And as I indicated before, the dung gate, that was because that's the gate that read, that, I'm sorry, it led out to the Hinnom Valley, which is south of Jerusalem. That's where their trash was taken. The trash and the animal dung, the guy that had to scoop it up and let's get it out of here, and they hauled it out. That's where the refuse was discarded. Okay. Thank you, King James. So they built all that. Nehemiah 3 and 15. Shalom, the son of Col Hozar. <laughs> Got some stuff on the mic here. Hal uh, Shalom, the son of Col. <laughs> Forget it. Leader of the district of Mizpah repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, and repaired the wall of the pool of Shelah by the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, leader of half the district of Beth Zur, made repairs as far as the place in front of the tombs of David to the man-made pool and as far as the house of the mighty. Okay, the fountain gate, that's on the east wall, just east of the dung gate. So you can see how we're being taken around Jerusalem. The Bible's given us the description counterclockwise. Now, the pool of Shelah it may be also known as the pool of Salome by the king's garden. Verse 16 says, the house of the mighty. Oh, first real quick, the pool of Salome, that's where Jesus told the man to go wash his eyes out, the blind man, so that he could see. Verse 16 says, the house of the mighty, or another version might say the house of the heroes. That could be the barracks where the King David's soldiers stayed. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23 talks about that. So <clears throat> they're rebuilding the old city and they see things of their history. That they're very proud to rebuild. They're very proud of their heritage and they're glad to be protecting it now. Nehemiah 3 and 17. After him, the Levites, under Rehum, the son of Bani, made repairs. Next to him, Hashabiah, leader of half the district of Keilah, made repairs for his district. After him, their brethren, under Bavi, the son of Hanadad, leader of the other half of the district of Keilah, made repairs. See, even leaders are getting involved. They're not too good, not too proud. And next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the leader of Mizpah, repaired another section in front of the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Bar Baruch, the son of Zabai, carefully repaired the other section from the buttress to the door of the house of El Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Mermoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz, 
repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. I promise we'll get there. And after him, the priests, the men of the plain, made repairs. After him, Benjamin and Hasib made repairs opposite their house. Now, guys, I want you to take particular notice right there. These guys are building on the wall close to their homes. Very particular, okay? After them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs by his house. After him, Benui, the son of Hanadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress, even as far as the corner. Palel, the son of Uzai, made repairs opposite the buttress and on the tower which projects from the king's upper house that was by the court of the prison. After him, Padea, the son of Parash, made repairs. Moreover, Nethanim, who built in Ophel, made repairs as far as the place in the front of the water gate toward the east and on the projecting tower. After them, the Tekoites repaired another section next to the great projecting tower and as far as the wall of Ophel. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, for getting me through that one, because that was a mouthful, and you do know we do line by line here, and when they say line by line, they're not kidding. All right. Whew. I feel like I got to take a rest. Mike, would you come preach for five minutes? So you saw the word buttress several times. Put that buttress pick up, the first one. If, I, don't, I don't remember how many I got. A buttress is a projecting support that uh, it's stone or whatever that's built up against a wall. It gives the wall extra strength. So you can see how they didn't just build a wall, but they made these walls very strong for military defense, okay? They're trying to make Jerusalem a safe place to live, safe from enemy attacks. So they reinforce the walls with a buttress. But you can also see what we read, how they sectioned off their work. This is your part right here. You do this here to here, and the next guy, well, he'll worry about his. You work. To the corner of your end, I'll meet you at the corner from my side. And that's really healthy competition. You know what? There's healthy competition in the body of Christ. You see somebody doing well, it makes you want to do well like them. And if you're not, well, maybe I better step it up. Or if you're getting a little too full of yourself and you're not building as well as the next guy, maybe I need to back off and get a little humility and build a little more like him. I think it's very healthy. that Here's your section. You know these guys are building watching the other guy. Hey, how'd you, how did you do that? Mine's not working out too well. I stick a rock here. It falls off. What'd you, well, here's what I did. did it like, oh, I did it like this. Okay, okay, thank you all. You see how they're helping each other out, right? I think it's, it builds not just the wall. Guys, they're building each other. They're not just building a wall. They're building each other. Friends, I come in here and I preach, okay? And I'm building best I can, but I'm hoping it builds you. And when it builds you, it builds the guy you're sitting next to, and it builds the guy sitting next to you because he's watching you, you're watching him. Do you see the parallels in this? This isn't just building a wall. This is building people. And you come here in the body of Christ, we're here to build you, to build your culture, to build each other. It's, guys, this is a good, good story. At first look, you're like, okay, they built a wall, so what? It's a good story. You work your section, and we're given points of reference for the wall here. The house of Eliashib, the high priest, Benjamin, and Hasab's house, Azariah's house, other houses were mentioned. These men built sections of the wall that was right by their homes. Imagine that. You're given charge. Okay, here's where you live. Fine. Build that spot right there. It would cause them to take a personal and firm dedication to building that part of the wall as strong as possible. Because if an enemy comes, if my house is exposed... I'm, my house is going to go down. My family's going to get hit. Yes, I want to build the part of the wall in front of my house. Christian, we're trying to teach you how to build up in the body of Christ so you can protect your family from the craziness of the outside world trying to infiltrate your living. The crazy news, the crazy people with the weird agendas and all the stupid stuff going on out there. We're trying to teach you how to build in front of your home Build a defense for your family and protect them. Amen. These guys were built and building right in front of their, their own home. They got the wall done in record time. Because, hey, just build it whatever you want to. Okay, I'm not going to take any particular interest. But, hey, brother, I want all of you guys, you build in front of your own house. They are going to build that wall and build it good. Now, this is good strategy because he did you know, the, the, the priests were invested personally in the sheep gate. That's our thing. That's our gate. We want to do that. You guys, y'all build in front of your houses. 
You see what God gave Nehemiah that's beyond our thinking to be able to build up as fast and as well and as strong as possible. Friends, I don't know how to build you up personally, but the Lord God is showing me through his word how to build up this congregation so that you can build up. It's all God given, this strategy, same strategy we use here. They're getting it done really fast, really well. Now, I want you to remember how Nehemiah told the king months before this time here when he would be done with this project. Remember, the king said, when are you coming back? He goes, I'll be back at this time. Then he went to Jerusalem. It was the first time he'd ever seen the wall. <laughs> how did he know when to tell the guy I'm gonna, when he's going to be done? How did he know that? Do you think Nehemiah already had this kind of a strategy in his mind before he even got to Jerusalem? You guys build by your home. You guys take personal investment in the sheep gate because that's your thing. Do you think Jeremiah, I'm, I'm sorry, Nehemiah, do you think he had that in his mind before he got there? I think he did. But I think he got it from the Lord God. I believe the Lord put it in his heart to build like this because any other way would have not got it done in the time frame that Nehemiah gave the king. He said, build it like this. Either put each man in front of his own home according to location, that'll motivate them, or because of their vocation, that will make them really, really, really build. If they had been attacked during construction, each man would have fought a lot more fiercely. How dare those people try to attack me and my home? I'm going to fight hard. That was another reason to build in front of their home. If an enemy got in there, Friend, let me just tell you, uh, you know how it is. Anybody tries to attack your family, are you not going to fight a whole lot more fiercely? You will fight to your death for your family because they're yours. Look at the strategy in building this wall. This is a great defense. Nehemiah 3 and 28. Beyond the horse gate, the priests made repairs, each in front of his own house. See, look, there it is again. Great. Now that you know what it means, each in front of his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Immer, made repairs in front of his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, made repairs. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaph, repaired another section. After him, Meshullam, the son of Berechiah, made repairs in front of his dwelling. After him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the Nethanim, and of the merchants in front of the mikveh gate, and as far as the upper room at the corner, and between the upper room at the corner, as far as the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. Okay. Oh, mercy, Lord, God help me. I'm, bleh. my mouth is ready to take a nap. So what's the name of the last gate mentioned here in verse 32? What's the last gate mentioned? That says the sheep gate. Now, what was the first gate? mentioned in verse 1, the sheep gate. What this means is we started and ended with the same gate. We've done a, a 360-degree view. The Bible took us on a 360-degree trip all the way around the in, entire city of Jerusalem. Okay, So you saw the jobs were assigned by location. They were also assigned by their vocation, like the priests on the sheep gate because that was directly tied to their work. We also saw people of different skill sets. They had different backgrounds, different careers, different interests, different trades, but they all worked on the wall. Different people doing the same thing together. Perfumers, goldsmiths, merchants, everybody pitched in, men, women, everybody, regardless of what their personal specific background was. Various people various backgrounds, and they all pitched in to help rebuild. We're all in it together. We're all in it together. Now, friends, this is a kingdom model for the body of Christ. This church, any church that preaches and teaches and believes in, in God's word and Messiah Jesus, it's a model for us. All of us here in this church, we have different backgrounds. We have different things that we do, but we are all here to build up the body of Christ. If you don't come here, I'm losing your skill set. I'm losing your strength, and you're losing mine and everybody else in here too. But we're all supposed to take the gospel to the lost. We're all supposed to build up the body of Christ. We are all supposed to build up and encourage everyone here. And your part may be different. Your part may be less. You may not be as familiar with your part. I'm a perfumer. Why am I working on a wall? But 
if you pitch in, we will help you. And it will not just build what you're working on. It will build you and it will build everybody else in here with you. And this is your best defense. Messiah Jesus, Holy Spirit indwelling you upon belief. And as you build, it's beneficial for you and everybody else that's here. So you have your own piece of this wall to build in this body of Christ. I've got my piece. I'm doing my piece. We, you have yours, whatever it is. We're all taking, well, I don't do anything in this church, Ray. Well, if you go out and share the gospel of Jesus with people, you are. That's your part of the wall to build. And guys, your part should be personal to you. It should be personal to you. Like it was the guys that built in front of their own home, in front of their house. This is personal to me because it comes to my family. It should be personal to build in the body of Christ. Because being in the body of Christ is your home. It is your defense. Now, you remember those nobles who didn't work. They didn't feel like it. They thought they were too good to work. They thought they were too high. They thought too highly of themselves. God's word says no one is too high to build the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, those that are proud, God opposes them. Be careful. Be careful of that. Well, not my thing. Be careful. Well, I'm too good for that. Be careful. Be careful. I remember that day we all built walls, so to speak. We had a lot of people in here painting. I'm not a painter. I don't know how to paint. I don't know if Chase knows how to paint. He must have covered, I don't know, a lot of that down that hallway. I mean, we were all doing stuff. Mike, Byron, all y'all were, a bunch of y'all were coming in here. How many of you are painters? I mean, many of you were probably not, but you did what you could, right? We all pitched in. The Word of God tells us we should all be building the body of Christ, and we should all use our varying gifts. You have gifts that I don't have. I'm looking at some of you eye to eye right now. You have gifts I do not have. Oh, you're the pastor. You're so wonderful, Ray. Hey, hey, you've got gifts I ain't got that I don't have. You're building a section of wall I can't build. Nehemiah couldn't build this whole thing himself. I can't do this whole thing myself. I need you. And you need me more than you realize. And everybody in here, we all need to use our various gifts. Romans 12, verse 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts deferring according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives, With liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Friends, whatever your traits are, whatever your skills, the things you're good at, take it and come use it in here. Use it with personal interest, with personal devotion, motivation, with diligence. That's your part to give. You realize when you came in here today, you brought in something the church didn't have without you, okay? We're all supposed to use it. We all have our unique gifts. We have our unique skills to build up everybody in the body of Christ. Even though we use our gifts in different areas and in different ways, just like a band, like a music band, they play different notes, but they're all producing music. A football team, they have different positions, but they're all pushing to the same goal, even though each different guy has a different place on the field. If we all do it, we're all pushing for the glory of God. This is for the glory of God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about how you feel. It ain't about how I feel. This is about the glory of God. You want to glorify your God? Then welcome to the body of Christ. Good place to be. So if you see somebody doing some service to God, and it can be a temptation to think, why can't I be like him? You ever done that? Oh, I wish I could play guitar as good as Byron. Oh, There's a temptation to say, I wish I could be like so-and-so over there. Why can't I do like this guy's doing? How come I can't do that work instead of this work? 
Then we start getting envious. Then that divisiveness creeps in. Oh gosh, I wish I could preach like Ray. You realize there's a lot of guys I wish I could preach like them. I wish I could do things like Mike can do. I wish I could do sound like Gabe does. I wish I. You you end up thinking about the other guy's wall. That's not your place. You do yours, and you do it the best you can. And then somebody will look at you and go, go, oh, how do you do that so well? Then you get to tell them how you do it. It's like, man, I used to wish I could do your part. <laughs> you concentrate on your part of the wall. What it might not be best suited, what they're doing might not be best suited for your gifts. Their place might be better suited for them, so do your part. I know we had goldsmiths and perfumers working on the wall, people whose gifts had nothing to do with wall building. But it was strategic for them to build where they were. It was their assignment. You could be thinking, well, Ray, I have no gifts. I have no skills that have anything to do with the church. You want to make a bet? You come talk to me about what your background is. I'll tell you what you can do with it in the body of Christ. I came up doing radio and electronics. Uh, I remember I went to Bible college and I, I, they said, do you have a degree? I had a degree in electronics engineering. I said, no, I don't have a degree. And they did some research and they said, yeah, you do. You've got a degree. Well, it's in electronics. Why didn't you tell us? Yeah, that transfers right in. I had no idea. I, I could use it for something. And now we're on the radio. I, I certainly have to mess with electronics with all this stuff. I'm using it. You have what can be used here. But guys, it could be a waste of time for you to try to serve in a way that God has not gifted you with. That's something else I want to point out. I've seen a lot of times people saying, well, I want to do this because they were envious of someone else. And so they tried to do work in the ministry that God never called them to do. I went to school with a whole college full of people that all said they were called to be pastors. They were not all called to be pastors. They tried to start a church and it fell miserably and it hurt a lot of people. You're not called to do exactly what you want necessarily. It, it could also be damaging for you to try to serve in another area where the Lord God has not assigned you. Let me put it in this context. Lots of people hate their job. I was that guy, I hate my job, I hate being here. I don't like it here. And they always think, I, I just wish I could be somewhere else, anywhere but here. Be careful that you do not try to abandon or try to hate the present assignment where God has assigned you to work. Be careful. You hate the job? Okay, hate the job, but love glorifying God there in it. Because there are lost people in that job place that need what you have. Build on your part of the wall. I can't build in your job. I'm not employed where you work. You have to build there. God has assigned your place to work. Do it for the glory of God. Now, Paul explained how believers should be about this in Ephesians 4.15. Grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective work by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying, which means building itself up in love. Your part is your part. Your piece of wall is your piece of wall. Take it personal. This is my part of the wall. God gave me this assignment. I'm going to do it the best I can because that's your place to build. Okay, you may hate your job. That's fine. Love the people in it. Glorify the Lord. Build on your part. So we're, we've got different people here. We've got perfumers. We've got goldsmiths. We've got priests to merchants. I'll tell you what, though. We don't need any nobles in here, okay? If you're a noble and you think you might be a noble and you're sorry about it, repent before the Lord and say, Father, forgive me. Come talk to us, and we'll, we'll plug you in, okay? We do different work, yet everybody's work is equally important. Your work is equally important. Well, Ray, I'm not doing as much as you. You're up there at that pulpit. you got the big radio show. You're the pastor. You've got the network. You, your part is just as important, just as important. Do you realize that the dung gate was no less important than the sheep gate? 
It was just as important because each had its own function. If you had any holes in the wall anywhere, the enemy could come in. Your part may not seem as important, but it is part of the defense, and we need to close that wall up. Don't look at me and say, I'm better, or I'm higher, or I'm whatever. Don't do that envious thing. Just take your part of the wall and work on that, okay? Building up the body of Christ is all of our responsibility. Friends, we're all in it together. There's no need to be envious, or I wish I could be like him or her or whatever. We're all in this together. It is all of our responsibility. It's our defense. It's all of our jobs to build where we are assigned. Don't be envious of somebody that seems to have the better assignment. They can't do your assignment. You can't do theirs either. God is using their gifting there. He's using your gifting where you are, and he assigns them where they are because that's suitable for their role. You're suitable for yours. I'll tell you right now, Byron is more suited to lead worship than I am because that's his assigned location. That's where he is set to build. I do my part next to him. That's my part to build, okay? So let's all build each other up in your respected assignments, your role where the Lord has placed us all individually as part of the whole body of Christ. Now, in Nehemiah 3, we saw individual people working together in unity to build up Jerusalem in their own capacity and their own assigned locations for the betterment of everyone. Any of them, they, many of them, they got their sense of godly service from their parents or from a good mentor, and that happens with us as well. Proverbs 23, 12, apply your heart to instruction and your ears to the words of knowledge. There's a version of the Bible out there called the easy-to-read version. I like it. It basically says, listen to your teacher and learn all you can. Listen and learn all you can. Nobles. They refuse to work. Apparently, they never learned to listen to instruction. Elisha had a long line of God-fearing men that had taught him well. He was wanting to work. The priests who rebuilt the sheep gate, they would not have been there if it wasn't for Ezra's ministry many years prior. That means they listened, right? They were listened to the calling to turn back to God. Now, this is the kind of effect I want this church to have, that you go out and you teach people in your way, in your assignment, in your giftings, where the Lord put you, you teach people the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you do that, you will have a great influence on people that will go out way past just you. We need to, we can turn our society into people who actually want to serve in the building up of the body of Christ. We don't have much of a society like that right now, but if we'll get out there and build, they will, it will have an influence and they will turn. Now, I know the world looks impossible out there, especially when you watch the news. Oh, gosh, that's the last thing I want to see. But it probably looked impossible to Nehemiah when he saw the broken down walls of Jerusalem. He probably thought, oh, my goodness, look at how bad this is. But because he had a team and because he had each person working in their assigned place, they were able to do it. And I'm telling you, however bad it looks out there, we have a team, we have the body of Christ, we are able to do it through Jesus Christ together. And I really want to drive that home, because you're not just here to hear me read a book. You can read that book at home. What I'm here to do is build you. You're here with other people for them to build you too. Well, I could read the Bible by myself. Sure, you can. Go home and read it. But coming in the body of Christ, this is building up together. This is teamwork. This is defense. This is protection. They built in record time, and it was done by God's plan, who put it in Nehemiah's heart to do it. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. How God called you, walk in it. Bring it here. We're better for it. Each person... You live in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to you, just as God has called you. But I want to say, don't be afraid of failing because you're not working in the kingdom of God by yourself. That's what all of us are here for. And thank you all for being here today. (laughs) Jesus is always with us. And plus, this is why you need to be in the assembly of God's church, because wherever you lack, someone else has it and vice versa. 
That's why it's important to know we're all in it together. You'll be set for life.